Good evening, and welcome to the second event in the 2023-24 Jepson Leadership Forum Series, Masculinity in a Changing World. I'm Jess, Jess Flanagan. I teach in the leadership school, the Jepson School, um, and um, I teach ethics, critical thinking, medical ethics, and leadership ethics applied in the field, and I'm the Richard L. Morrill Chair in Ethics and Democratic Values. Dean Sandra Peart regrets that she cannot be with us this evening as we welcome Dr. Rob Henderson for his discussion, Understanding the Young Male Syndrome. The last few decades have seen rapid changes in gender relations and norms in the household, in the workforce, and in government. And so this year, we thought we would invite some speakers to discuss masculinity in the context of these recent cultural changes. So specific topics that we're gonna see coming up include the rule of hormones and gender identity and behavior, status competition, violence, challenges facing men as a result of the changing nature of the family and the economy, black masculinity in the United States, and the past and future of global patriarchy. Um, so I hope that you're enjoying the series so far, and um, this promises to be a great installment of an ongoing conversation about men and masculinity. So we are all really looking forward to tonight's discussion here in Jepson, and we're so happy that you could all join us both in person and also via the live stream. So hello out there, live stream folks. Earlier this afternoon, Jepson student Jackson Hardy sat down with Rob Henderson for a videotaped interview, the content of which we will post on our website at a later date, so stay tuned. Jackson is a senior here at Richmond from Lawrenceville, Georgia, who is a business and leadership studies student. He comes from a long line of college athletes, and while not spiders, Jackson's father, great-grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather all played football at the college level. Jackson's also one of my students in leadership ethics applied in the field, so I really appreciate him taking the time to talk to Dr. Henderson. And in addition to all of his studies here in Jepson and business, he's one of the quarterbacks for the Richmond Spiders football team. Yay! <laughs> so if you're a fan, keep an eye out. He's number 12. So that's right, right? Yeah, I got your number, yeah. So Jackson will now introduce our speaker, Dr. Rob Henderson. So please join me in welcoming Jackson to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Flanagan, for your introduction. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's forum speaker, Dr. Rob Henderson. Dr. Henderson is an author and psychologist. Once described as self-made by the New York Times, he grew up in foster homes in California. After graduating high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force, where he received many awards and honors for his service. Eventually, he attended Yale on the GI Bill with a, uh, and graduated with a B.S. in psychology in 2018. He attended the University of Cambridge as a Gates Cambridge Scholar, earning a doctorate in psychology in 2022. In addition to his popular Substack newsletter, Dr. Henderson's writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe, among other outlets. His forthcoming book, Troubled, a memoir of foster care, family, and social class, will be published by Simon, Simon and Schuster in February. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rob Henderson. Thanks, Jackson. Thanks, Jess. Can everyone hear me? Are we good? All right, and uh, thank you to everyone who helped to organize this event. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here with all of you. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a psychologist and author to speak about what social scientists have termed the young male syndrome. Uh, behind such concepts, though, are flesh and blood human beings with their own unique stories and experiences. Psychology and the social sciences more broadly are useful for describing aggregate patterns and identifying the causes and effects behind them, but it can fall short when it comes to acknowledging the depth and complexity and richness of people's actual lives. So before I delve into the theoretical and empirical work underlying the young male syndrome, I'll begin by just briefly, oh, there we go, uh, speaking about my own unusual life, uh, which can be understood through the origins of my 
name, Robert Kim Henderson. Um, all three of my names were taken from different adults. Robert comes from my supposed biological father. Uh, until recently, the only information I had about him uh, is from a document provided by a social worker responsible for my case when I was a foster child. I recently took a 23andMe DNA test and discovered that I'm half Hispanic on my father's side. My middle name, Kim, comes from my biological mother who moved from South Korea to Los Angeles where I was born, and Kim was her family name. She succumbed to drug addiction, rendering her unable to care for me, and I was subsequently placed in the foster care system in LA. And my last name, Henderson, comes from my former uh, adoptive father. After my adoptive mother left him, he severed ties with me. He figured that my emotional pain from his desertion would be transmitted to my adoptive mother, and he was right. So as you might imagine, these were extremely difficult experiences for me. My life temporarily improved, though, when my adoptive mother entered a relationship with a woman named Shelly. Uh, together, they created a relatively stable home for my adoptive sister and me during my adolescence in a dusty blue-collar town in Northern California called Red Bluff. And when, when I was in eighth grade, my, my mom and Shelly bought some, some lumber when they learned that heating a house with firewood was less expensive than central heating. I spent several hours one afternoon stacking the oak and cedar logs next to our little shed in the backyard. That year, I, I'd wake up at 5.30 a.m. every morning to build a fire so that the house would be warm by the time my moms got up to get ready for work at 7 a.m. I did this all winter uh, when temperatures would dip into the low 30s frosty weather for Californians. At first, I argued with my moms about my new chore, uh, and Shelley calmly replied that she and my mom worked all day to pay the bills, and that helping to keep the house warm was the least I could do as the man of the house. At age 13, this was the first time anyone had described me as a man, uh, and I implicitly grasped that it had something to do with responsibility and contribution. So, so my hope is that by the end of this discussion of the young male syndrome, we'll have a fuller understanding of the, the message my two moms were trying to convey to my 13-year-old self. Um, so of course, there are many ways of understanding what being a man is about, and there are many valid ways to be a man. However, regardless of how it is expressed, it usually has something to do with strength and toughness and productivity. In his cross-cultural research, the psychologist Martin J. Seeger has found three consistent requirements to achieve the status of manhood in various societies around the world. First, the individual must be a fighter and a winner. Second, he must be a provider and protector. And third, he must maintain mastery and control of himself at all times. Across culture, there seems to be an implicit understanding of, of what being a man is. Uh, in a widely cited study of 25 cultures, including New Zealand, Finland, Zimbabwe, Malaysia, Pakistan, Bolivia, and Trinidad, definitions of masculinity and femininity hardly fluctuated at all. Uh, as a rule, participants in this study said they did not believe that men and women differed in all respects, and they did not view one sex as inherently superior to the other, but in every culture, men were seen as more active, adventurous, dominant, forceful, independent, and strong. Contemporary polemicists will rhetorically ask questions like, what is a woman? But seldom does anyone ask, what is a man? People seem to already know. Uh, many individuals will resort to commonplace expressions such as man up, or be a man, or more crassly, grow some balls. In polite society, people won't publicly express such remarks, but many will still think them. Men, of course, are responsive to these statements. Uh, in a famous literary illustration, Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth uh, reinforced the conception of manhood as strength. Uh, early on in this 17th century play, she receives a letter from her husband. The letter details an encounter with three witches in their prophecy that her husband, Macbeth, will take over the throne from King Duncan. Lady Macbeth is eager for this power and insists that she and her husband must murder the king themselves in order for this prophecy to come true. Lady Macbeth expresses her concerns, however, when she grows worried about whether her husband will be manly enough to follow through with this agreement. 
Her fears are confirmed when Macbeth, upon reflecting on the consequences of treason, subsequently backs out of the plan. Lady Macbeth then persuades her husband when she proclaims that if he were to go through with the murder, he would not only be a man, but so much more. <laughs> By dangling the enticing reputation of manliness over her husband, Lady Macbeth succeeds in getting him to kill the king and subsequently setting in motion the chaotic events of the rest of the story. Shakespeare was clearly a keen observer of human nature in general and of men's anxieties about their masculinity in particular. Such anxieties regarding the belief that manhood is something that must be achieved through action appear to be ubiquitous around the world. I'll offer a few brief examples. Uh, on the Greek Aegean island of Kalymnos, many of the inhabitants make their living by commercial sponge fishing. The men dive deep into water without the aid of special equipment, which they scorn. Diving is a gamble because many men are stricken and injured. Young divers who take precautions are mocked as effeminate and ridiculed by their peers. Halfway around the world in the high mountains of Melanesia, young boys undergo intense trials before achieving the status of manhood. Young boys are torn from their mothers and forced to undergo a series of brutal masculinizing rituals. These include whippings, beatings, and other forms of terror from older men, which the boys must endure stoically and silently. This community believes that without such hazing, boys will never mature into men but remain weak and childlike. Real men are made, they insist, not born. To this extent, the psychologist Roy Baumeister has written that in many societies, any girl who grows up automatically becomes a woman. Meanwhile, a boy does not automatically become a man and is instead often required to prove himself, usually by passing stringent tests or producing more than he consumes. In many non-industrialized, small-scale societies, girls are believed to become women when they are physically able to produce children. The ability to have kids is considered a major contribution in itself to the community. Boys, in contrast, do not have a clear and visible biological indicator of manhood and must often endure culturally sanctioned rituals and painful trials to become men. Uh, indeed, masculinity is widely considered to be an artificially induced status achievable only through testing and careful instruction. Real men do not simply emerge like butterflies from their boyish cocoons. Rather, they must be carefully shaped and nurtured and counseled and prodded into manhood. The literary critic Alfred Habiger has remarked that masculinity has, a certain, has an uncertain and ambiguous status. It is something to be acquired through a struggle, a painful initiation, or a long and sometimes humiliating apprenticeship. So let's, let's now consider the, the Mehinaku, an indigenous community located in a remote part of central Brazil. I'm going to dwell on this society at some length because they are explicitly and self-consciously a non-violent society. The Mehinaku go out of their way to maintain peace with neighboring communities that are more aggressive and confrontational. Yet, as we'll see, even this community exhibits familiar patterns regarding cultural conceptions of masculinity and manhood. The Mehinaku reside among impassable streams and waterfalls, making their territory inaccessible to all but the most determined outsiders. They depend on river and lake fish for protein, and the men are expected to go on long fishing expeditions to distant waters over rough and hazardous terrain, sometimes for days or weeks. The Mehinaku men are very concerned about their manhood. For them, manliness is a status equivalent to the highest social virtue. A man's prestige comes not necessarily from being a good man in some abstract moral sense, but from being good at being a man which entails living up to the three rules I mentioned before regarding provisioning, protection, and mastery documented by Martin Seeger. These men earn their laurels by trying to outperform the others in fishing prowess and in accumulating property such as tools and other goods. The community judges a man's industriousness, his willingness to go on long and arduous fishing trips, often over treacherous terrain where rival coalitions might ambush and attack them. A fear of economic inadequacy haunts these men. They experience intense anxiety about appearing slothful or lethargic. When a man returns from a dangerous fishing expedition, he is expected to appear immediately in the village plaza where people gather expectantly. He then ostentatiously displays his catch before distributing it unsparingly. The anthropologist David Gilmore describes the norms within this community and notes that the hallmark of a real man is that he is selfless. He always shares his food in contrast Men who are stingy are seen as parasitic and despised as freeloaders. The Mehinaku men instill a sense of hard work, civic duty, and the conventional understanding of manliness into little boys. 
For example, if a boy sleeps in late or lounges about or refuses to accompany his father on fishing expeditions, he is mocked and called a little girl. Moreover, a boy is often warned that if he is lazy, then when he grows up, he will be undesirable to women. Thus, this community has managed to ignite the cauldron of young male energy and channel, channel it away from warfare with neighboring communities and toward economic productivity, industriousness, and generosity with a coinciding increase in desirability to potential romantic partners. Uh, as I mentioned, the Mehinaku fight no wars and are regarded as a nonviolent society. Interestingly, though, they regularly organize wrestling matches in which strict rules of decor decorum are observed. The wrestling is known to be spirited and aggressive, but result in few injuries other than minor scrapes and bruises. The men try to defeat one another in these organized contests, and winners receive the respect of their community. All men are expected to wrestle, to give their best effort, and if possible, to win. Avoiding participation in the wrestling matches is considered a severe character deficiency, a betrayal of civic duty. The community demands to know the relative formidability of each man, and these contests provide a low-cost way of revealing this information. Indeed, some psychologists have suggested that one reason, uh, though not the only reason, that societies have independently developed athletic competitions is that they serve to advertise the physical qualities of individual males. Contests involving coordination, explosive strength, and physical prowess help to provide clear proxies for capability in hunting and warfare to male observers and also provide information about romantic mate value to female observers. Uh, that is, sports can provide the functional equivalent of courtship displays. David Gilmore notes that the Mehinaku men engage in these daily contests largely for female approval. Success at beating other men translates into success in the mating game. Women frequently shout encouragement from the sidelines and express interest in the victors. A man who refuses or regularly loses these contests experiences what Gilmore describes as social marginalization and an ever dwindling status. We'll speak more about status in a few moments, but for now let's concentrate on the title of this discussion, Understanding the Young Male Syndrome. Uh, the concept of the young male syndrome was developed by the psychologists Margot Wilson and Martin Daly, and it refers to a pattern of risk-taking behavior that is more pronounced in males in their late teens and early 20s relative to other demographic groups. The research that informs this framework suggests that this increased risk-taking is the result of both social and biological factors, including sociocultural pressures and hormonal changes for instance, testosterone levels in males increase by 800% on average at age 14. The young male syndrome gives rise to competitiveness and a willingness to take physical and reputational gambles, especially when romantic partnership status and territory are at stake. Uh, in psychological research, the young male syndrome has been linked with higher rates of aggressive behavior, substance abuse, reckless driving, and other potentially dangerous activities. Of course, this is a generalized pattern, and not all young males exhibit this behavior. Nevertheless, the sex differences are striking. Uh, a baby boy born in the US has an astonishing risk profile. Uh, men are three times more likely to die before the age of 25, three times more likely to become addicted to drugs or alcohol, and an incredible 19 times more likely to end up in jail. A man is more than twice as likely to, as a woman to have a car accident and three times more likely to be involved in two car accidents. Even when not driving, men are more careless. Twice as many men compared with women are killed simply crossing the street. Maleness is by far the biggest risk factor for violence. Men kill men massively more often than women kill women, on average 26 times more often. These patterns extend beyond the US. When data on violent crime are gathered from around the world, the result is utterly clear and amazingly consistent. Crime statistics from Australia, Botswana, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Iceland, India, Kenya, Mexico, Nigeria, Scotland, Uganda, and the United Kingdom all exhibit the same basic pattern. In each of these societies, without a single exception, young males are by far the most likely to be the perpetrators as well as the victims of murder. Men get into fights more than women. They play more violent video games and watch more violent movies. They're more likely to be hospitalized for punching walls. They're more likely to fantasize about killing another person, and they're more likely to actually kill another person. They're also more likely to kill themselves. Uh, in both the US and the UK, men are three times more likely than women to commit suicide. Globally, more than 90% of homicides are committed by men, and most of the homicide victims are also men, about 70%. Um, interestingly, the figures for chimpanzees are nearly identical. 92% of chimpanzee... <laughs> 
killers are, uh, are male, and 73% of chimpanzee victims are male. Homicide is a, is a crime committed mostly by young men from the US to Japan and worldwide generally. Uh, although contingent material and ideological conditions can exacerbate or inhibit the tendency toward violence, the basic evolutionary foundations of this impulse are much older than humanity itself. Modern societies have, uh, to some extent, managed to inhibit male aggression. Violent death rates among hunter-gatherer societies with little, little or no contact with Western culture exceed the murder rate recorded in contemporary America's most crime-ridden cities. In hunter-gatherer societies, roughly one in seven men die as a result of homicide. A global assessment of 31 hunter-gatherer societies found that 64% of them engage in warfare once every two years. Such violent conflicts are carried out almost exclusively by men. In a 2012 paper published in the journal Human Nature, the psychologists Aaron Sell, Liana Hone, and Nicholas Pound wrote that if modern Western societies had homicide rates as high as some foraging peoples, a male graduate student would be more likely to be killed than to get a tenure track position. To reiterate, for all societies for which there are data, the vast majority of violence is concentrated among young men. Uh, and the young male syndrome, of course, specifically concerns young men. Uh, in the US, a 20-year-old man is 10 times more likely to be arrested for a violent crime than a 60-year-old man. Uh, and as I mentioned, most of their targets are young men. Uh, to this extent, the major trigger of young male homicides around the world are what social scientists refer to as trivial altercations. When they are put down by other men in public, nearly all young men will experience a flash of rage. Most manage to inhibit it, but some act to extinguish the source of their humiliation. The psychologist Douglas T. Kenrick has written that for young guys, being respectful toward other young men is probably even more important than a healthy diet to ensure longevity. <laughs> Violence and crime aside, uh, the impulsivity of the young and the male can be observed even in everyday situations. One study found that compared with adults aged 55 and older, young adults aged 18 to 25 are two and a half times more likely to press the send button without first reading over their emails. Um, <laughs> Moreover, while 40% of women reported that they checked their emails before sending them, only 25% of men did so. To be sure, there are sociocultural influences involved here, but environmental factors do not operate on blank slates. To understand young men and young women, you have to take into account not only the cultural context, but also evolved sex differences. Uh, consider the claim that societies encourage males to be aggressive. This is true in some ways. People, especially peers, often send the message to boys that they should be tough. Overall, though, we spend far more time discouraging male aggression compared with female aggression. Why? Because young males are generally more aggressive. Or consider the claim that we tell girls to be quiet and passive. Again, we do this sometimes, but more often we tell boys to be quiet and passive. Why? For the same reason. Boys are, on average, louder and more disruptive. Research finds that boys are punished more often and more severely for uh, aggression. Overall, young males are more aggressive despite culture, not because of it. I, I was once standing on an airport train on my way to uh, another terminal, and I saw a young woman and her son, who must have been about four years old, and as the, the train began moving, uh, she asked the boy to hold on to the, the train handle, and, uh, and he ignored her and said, I want to surf, and he held out his hands as the train began to move. And uh, I could see the mother was nervous and again firmly asked him to hold on to the railing. And despite her admonitions, the boy refused. Uh, and he maintained his balance, though, and he smiled, clearly pleased with himself at his own success. And I have no doubt similar stories exist for young girls. But generally speaking, this type of risky behavior and obliviousness to the potential for physical harm is more common among boys. Researchers have found that the trait of what is called surgency, or high activity and impulsivity, uh, shows a large sex difference with boys scoring higher than girls. These findings likely help to account for the fact that boys experience far more disciplinary difficulties in school. A male bent toward risk taking is partly, though not entirely, a function of environmental incentives and culturally driven socialization. The biologist Carol Hooven, who, who, who I understand is going to be a, a speaker at this series, uh, she points out that testosterone levels in men peak in their early 20s and studies have consistently shown a correlation between testosterone and violence and testosterone and competitiveness. These phenomena have an evolutionary basis. Uh, in the ancestral environment, young men had to stand out in order to obtain 
mates, a dynamic that long predates humanity itself. Over the past few decades, biologists have found that maleness and femaleness are rooted in something very simple, how quickly the two sexes can reproduce. Biologists refer to this as the maximum reproductive rate. In short, the maximum reproductive rate for females is much slower than it is for males. Among humans, women are constrained to approximately 30-some gestations in their lifetime, assuming an extreme situation of near-continuous pregnancy from roughly age 13 to menopause. In contrast, men can potentially father a, a far larger number of offspring. Look at it this way, uh, an average man produces 255 million sperm per ejaculation. By contrast, women produce only 400 eggs in their entire lives. Overall, across an average man's lifespan, he produces 3.6 billion times more sex cells than the average woman. If you lined up one man's sperm production from head to tail, it would circle the earth twice, while a woman's eggs would circle a ping pong ball once. <laughs> so, to put it somewhat crudely, sperm is cheap and abundant, and eggs, <laughs> eggs are expensive and, and precious. <laughs> Thus, the, uh, the producers of the sperm compete to appeal to individuals who produce the eggs. Males produce this massive overabundance of sperm in the hopes of offering it to females, but the vast majority of females are distinctly uninterested in what the vast majority of males have to offer. <laughs> Females, on average, are much choosier than males about whom they're willing to partner with. And so there's sharp competition among males to stand out, to be favored, and to be chosen. And this gives rise to increased conflict between males. Uh, to be clear, this competitive behavior doesn't necessarily occur consciously. Many uh, human behaviors operate at a pre-attentive level. Most of the time, we don't have an explicit mental model of how our behaviors might benefit us. We aren't always aware of how our actions might lead to an increased likelihood of obtaining resources or winning social allies or attracting romantic partners any more than a spider weaving a web can visualize the end product that results from doing what comes naturally. The differences in propensity for physical confrontation have resulted in sexual dimorphism or distinctions in physical form between men and women. For instance, the shoulders of boys and girls are of roughly equal size until adolescence. At puberty, though, shoulder cartilage cells in males respond to testosterone, causing them to expand. Increased testosterone also results in the thickening of the male brow, ridge, and skull in order to withstand damage from attacks by other males. Plainly, in the ancestral environment, men with relatively thin skulls were less likely to survive violent encounters compared with men with greater bone density, who are more likely to survive, find romantic partners, and produce offspring. The wider shoulders, larger arms, and greater bone mass of Male humans appear to be the result of intrasexual conflict or male-on-male -male violence. Uh, intriguingly, some evolutionary researchers have argued that male secondary sex characteristics evolved not to attract females, but rather to compete against other males. Uh, consider the example of beards. Why do males develop facial hair during puberty? Evidence is mixed about whether women find beards attractive. Some women like them, others don't. For others, it depends. But there is clear evidence that men view other men with beards as more intimidating than clean-shaven men. Or take deep voices. Women, on average, tend to think deep voices are attractive. But in comparison, men are even more likely to find men with deep voices to be intimidating. The same basic pattern has been found for muscularity. Women find it to be attractive up to a certain point. But men report feeling threatened by large physicality uh, in other males. Such research suggests that intersexual competition has given rise to male traits uh, such as broad shoulders, large muscles, deep voices, and facial hair. Men evolved these traits not so much because women find them sexy, but more so because other men find them intimidating. Uh, as the psychologist Steve Stewart Williams has written, male secondary sex characteristics appear to be more like deer's antlers than peacock's tails. The peacock's tail evolved to attract male peahens, but male deer evolved antlers not to impress female deer, but to compete with other males. The same logic seems to apply to the characteristics of human males. Men developed specialized features for the specific purpose of in intimidation and competition against other males. And this is why guys will often show off to each other before fights by puffing out their chests and expanding their uh, arm muscles, you can see this behavior during weigh-ins for boxing and mixed martial arts competitions. Males possess physical attributes and a psychological disposition that inclines them toward violence, as well as a physique that is uniquely equipped to withstand physical harm. 
uh, in the ancestral environment, young men who were more adept fighters could deter other males from obtaining romantic partners and were often more successful in attracting partners themselves. Today, even in the peaceful Mehinaku society, wrestling matches are organized to rank males by their capacity for violence. And this brings us to a key question. What are the roots of the young male syndrome? Why do these striking sex differences in impulsivity, risk-taking, and violence exist? Uh, and to answer these questions, we must first understand the importance of social status. I'll use a definition from the psychologist Cameron Anderson, who characterizes status as the respect, admiration, and voluntary deference individuals are afforded by others. When people defer to us or offer us respect or admiration or praise or allow us to influence them in some way, that's status. Uh, it is a resource as real as oxygen or water. In a widely cited 2012 study, Cameron Anderson and his colleagues found that sociometric status, defined as respect and admiration from peers, is a stronger predictor of well-being than socioeconomic status. Moreover, in a 2015 study also led by Anderson, found that across 123 countries, people's well-being consistently depended on the degree to which people felt respected by others. Attainment of status or its loss was the strongest predictor of long-term positive and negative feelings. Other studies have found that people report experiencing more envy toward individuals who are held in high social esteem compared with people who have lots of money. Uh, put differently, status appears to be a stronger generator of envy than material affluence, again indicating just how important status is to people. The desire for status is often viewed as tawdry or unserious. Many people resist the idea that status is so important, but they don't resist equivalent terms. Uh, if you say you want a job promotion for the status, you might be judged harshly. But if you say you want to be promoted because you want respect, that's often regarded as a, an appropriate desire. But these two terms mean roughly the same thing. To this extent, recent scholarship has found that status is far from shallow or unsophisticated. Uh, indeed, it is, a, it is a complex topic worthy of careful attention. Status is something that lives in the minds of other people. Uh, this explains why researchers have found that when two men have an argument on the street, the presence of a third person, a witness, doubles the likelihood that the encounter will escalate from a verbal altercation to one that involves violence. The New York University professor of psychiatry, James F. Gilligan, has spent three decades studying the causes of violence, and he has found that, quote, time after time, men give the same answer as to why they assault or kill, because he disrespected me. In this context, disrespect essentially means that the target lowered or attempted to lower the aggressor's status. Psychologists have found that social status can be broken down into two different types, dominance and prestige. The dominance is evolutionarily older and more commonly observed among animals. Dominance in humans is associated with narcissism, aggression, and hostility. Under the dominance framework, status is attained by instilling fear in others through coercion, intimidation, and displays of brute force. Humans and other animals confer status to dominant individuals because of what the individuals can do to them inflict costs, pain, humiliation, injuries, disfigurement, violence, reputation, destruction, and so on. As an example, Joseph Stalin attained status through dominance. While dominance can confer benefits, it is often associated with instability and tension. Uh, in her illuminating book on pride, uh, the psychologist Jessica Tracy has written that dominant people pay for their less kindly road to status by incurring the dislike and even hatred of their fellow group members, and for many of us, this price is simply too high. We'd rather be low on the totem pole than be perceived as arrogant and domineering. Then there's the second type of status, prestige. It is evolutionarily more recent and pervasive across human societies. Prestige is associated with stable self-esteem, social acceptance, and being well-liked. Prestige is freely conferred on individuals based on their knowledge, skills, or success. We confer status to prestigious individuals because of what these individuals can do for us. Provide us with benefits, teach us useful things, entertain us, grant us access to resources, bolster our own status by being associated with them, and so on. As an example, the late physicist Stephen Hawking attained status via prestige. To be clear, dominance and prestige are not always entirely separable. In some cases, the two can be combined. Uh, for instance, military members uh, and police officers are often considered to be both dominant and prestigious, uh, depending on the political climate. And, yeah. There is a lot of variation across time and culture regarding how humans pursue status. 
Under a prestige framework, social rank is based on differences in skills and value domains. Among hunter-gatherers, these include activities such as fishing, hunting, warfare, tool-making, navigation, storytelling, medicine-making, child-rearing, and so on. In industrialized society, symbols of prestige include job titles, educational credentials, scholarly citations, luxury automobiles, access to exclusive nightclubs, and so on. Uh, and because not everyone is equally talented in all valued domains, status disparities inevitably emerge. Compared to dominance, though, prestige offers rewards uh, that are at least as compelling or even more so. Prestige signifies a different and more positive sum form of social currency in both non-industrialized and developed countries alike. Prestige serves as an effective mode of acquiring status through skill, contribution, or specialized knowledge rather than coercion or force. And the core reason why our human ancestors cared about status and passed this onto us is because it was directly tied to the ability to obtain critical resources, secure social allies, attract romantic partners, and ultimately the likelihood of producing offspring. Uh, humans are not all equally kind, intelligent, healthy, ambitious, resourceful, attractive, empathic, generous, and so on. Men and women are not interchangeable in terms of their desirable traits. This variation gives rise to competition for desirable partners. Men who accumulate status and power and are not confined by institutional rules or strong social norms have more female partners than ordinary men. Uh, as the Harvard biologist Richard Wrangham has written, if a male wins power, he will tend to use it to mate with as many females as possible. In most post-agricultural societies throughout history, such as among the Aztecs, Babylonians, Chinese, Egyptians, Incans, Indians, and Romans, harems of hundreds of women were often the norm for kings, emperors, and pharaohs. The largest number of children that any man has ever had is 888. This individual was a Moroccan emperor named Ishmael the Bloodthirsty, who reigned from 1672 to 1727. Equivalently powerful women throughout history, such as Cleopatra, did not accumulate large harems of hundreds of attractive young men. They could have, but they didn't. To be clear, not all powerful men follow this specific pattern. Alexander the Great never showed more than a passing interest in women and fathered just a single child by the time he died at age 32. But Alexander bucked the trend. Uh, a 2016 study of 33 non-industrialized small-scale societies found that among humans, men's status, as indexed by wealth and political influence, is positively associated with several reproductively relevant outcomes, uh, including number of sexual partners, number of offspring, and number of offspring surviving into adulthood. In developed countries, men who obtain high levels of income or occupational prestige are more likely to find a romantic partner and have children. A study from 2019 found that a man at the top of the earnings distribution has a more than 90% chance of obtaining a committed romantic partner. In contrast, for men at the bottom, less than 40% find one. In most societies, successful men try to convert their high status into reproductive success. Of course, human culture is diverse and varied, and constraints on powerful men can inhibit their impulses. Uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, who together possess more wealth than the bottom 50% of Americans combined, each have only three children. Elon Musk, currently the richest man in the world, is seen as prolific with 11 children in total, but his fertility is on par with the median woman in Massachusetts in the late 17th century. <laughs> At that time, uh, family sizes of more than 10 children were common in New England. To be clear, the quest for increased romantic opportunities is not the only reason why men seek status. The desire to attract women is often unconscious with no direct link to the emotional systems that drive men to triumph in conflicts against male competitors. Rather, men are inclined to seek status for its own sake, even in scenarios where local norms limit their ability to obtain multiple romantic partners. Acquiring wealth and status is intrinsically satisfying, even if it never leads to increased romantic appeal. Human males appear to have a general program installed that propels them to stand out among males, even if no women are present, as is the case in prisons. Besting others is often a reward in itself because in the ancestral environment, victory was so closely tied to romantic success. Nevertheless, if given a contrived choice between material prosperity but permanent celibacy or material impoverishment accompanied by abundant, abundant romantic interest from numerous women, the majority of young males would prefer the latter. In other words, most guys would prefer to be poor but romantically appealing rather than rich but romantically shunned. This discussion uh, about status raises uh, another important question. If men, to varying degrees, intrinsically desire status and its accompanying benefits, 
Why are so many young men now disengaging from education and employment to historically reliable paths to obtaining respect and admiration? Men now make up only 40% of college students, a gender gap that has been growing for decades. In the next few years, two women will earn a college degree for every one man. Today, one in six American men between the ages of 25 and 54 are unemployed or out of the workforce altogether. This amounts to more than 10 million men, a number that has more than doubled since the 1970s. There used to be economic incentives to work, but in rich societies, this is becoming less necessary for survival. There used to be social incentives to work, but today people are generally less apt to praise young men for uh, obtaining employment or condemn them for being jobless. There used to be romantic incentives to work, but a man with a job is less appealing than he would have been in previous decades. Very few young men are inclined to expend the effort necessary to strive and improve and advance in education and employment without at least one of these external incentives. Moreover, today, men have entertaining digital devices, video games, internet pornography, and a variety of other avenues to facilitate simulated status attainment and sexual gratification. As an analogy, uh, many young men will not travel to the grocery store and then cook a nutritious meal when they can satisfy their hunger by ordering fast food on Uber Eats. Ultimately, artificial junk food is less satisfying than real ingredients, but convenience combined with the absence of external incentives to prepare a real meal means that a growing number of individuals are opting for convenience and immediate gratification. Young males are inevitably going to try to obtain status, whether in the real world or in a digital one, but anthropological and psychological evidence indicates that people whom young males wish to impress, such as peers, high-status individuals, respected authority figures, and young women, have a lot of influence as to which activities confer status. If we don't want to see young men fall prey to the worst expressions of the young male syndrome, we must be intentional in guiding the avenues through which they seek status. If parents, caregivers, educators, peers, cultural trailblazers, potential romantic partners, and other influential members of society overlook the important roles they play, then men will lack the guidance they need to opt into productive paths to prestige and will either take the path of dominance or drop out of society by playing virtual status games with no real world benefit or contribution. Uh, as I document in my, my forthcoming book, in my own life, enlisting in the military redirected the bleak trajectory I was on as a teenager who grew up in foster homes and barely graduated from high school. And one reason I made this decision was that two older men for whom I had a great deal of respect strongly recommended this option to me. One was my best friend's father, who was a veteran and retired police officer, and the other was my history teacher who had served in the Air Force before transitioning to a career in education. Returning to the story I opened with, uh, my two moms, these two hardworking women who did their best to care for me under trying circumstances, were the first to introduce the idea of manhood to me as an achieved status that must be earned through effort and contribution. One core lesson I've drawn both from my own unusual life and a close reading of the relevant research is that young males desire guidance and are deeply responsive to it. They yearn to know how to earn the cherished rewards of respect and admiration the energy and ambition of young men can be channeled into positive directions. But if boys aren't exposed to positive examples of masculinity in their personal lives, they will look for it elsewhere. In contemporary Western societies, parents, teachers, coaches, local community leaders, and other high-status figures used to raise boys to become men, imparting lessons about personal responsibility, hard work, relationships, and obligations. Today, in the absence of such guidance, many young boys are being raised by viral TikTok influencers peddling diluted and ungrounded conceptions of masculinity. High-status individuals have a societal responsibility to guide young men toward constructive avenues for status acquisition. Uh, by doing so, they not only help to mitigate the risks associated with the young male syndrome, but also contribute to the cultivation of a more balanced and uh, harmonious society. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sweet. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I learned so much, and there's so much interesting content there, including if any of you in the crowd are thinking about a name for your death metal band, Ishmael the Bloodthirsty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> News you can use. Um, all right. So we have some questions from that were pre-submitted, and I'll just kind of package them together. 
Uh, a lot of the pre-submitted questions were about foster care, and okay. so I was going to over with that. Um, and basically, people are just wondering. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. I got like a little microphone here. Are they good? All right. So a lot of the pre-submitted questions are about foster care, and I would summarize them as: What would you recommend to make foster care better for like the development, especially of young men? I mean, so in my book, I, I ultimately make this point that you know we want to, we want to have a society where foster care isn't really necessary in the first place. Uh, but because I mean, I think no matter how you, any any fix will be, you know, imperfect at best. Yeah. I mean, one one is that so so in my case, I mentioned that you know I I, I never met my father and my mother was you know, not in a position to take care of me. Uh, and yet I still lived in seven different foster homes. Uh, so I moved, you know, every couple of, you know, every year or, or so. And, um, and this was despite the, so, so one, one reason why, they, why the foster care system does this is because they don't want the foster children to develop an attachment to any one particular caregiver just in case the parent, one of their parents becomes available again to care for the child. Uh, and if a child lives with the same family for you know, a couple of years, this can create um, you know, sort of difficulties around loyalty and so on. But for me, uh, it probably would have been beneficial to just uh, 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 whatever, put me up for adoption right away rather than uh, being in this sort of rotating system of different homes. Uh, so I think that could be one, one option is to just pay closer attention to the birth family mm -hmm. and the available options for the foster kids uh, in order to, to sort of reach stability uh, as soon as possible. More stability. Um, so one thing that you're very known for is this concept of luxury beliefs. And so um, I w some people were asking the questions, and I'm also curious. What do you think are luxury beliefs about gender? Hmm. Yeah, I, I've seen people apply this term. So, so just very quickly for, for some in the audience. So, so luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that confer status on the affluent while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. Uh, I developed this term in 2019. I've been writing about it and, and speaking about it for, for a couple of years now, a few years now. Um, I haven't really personally applied it to, to gender, but I have seen uh, you know, certain uh, uh, factions within feminism apply this term uh, uh, with like, some of the contentious discussions around trans issues. I don't really, I, I guess one might be, um, I've seen some discussion around uh, uh, putting, what, male to female transgender people in women's prisons. And I suppose this could be a luxury belief in that the majority of people in prisons come from, from uh, low socioeconomic backgrounds. And so essentially you're exposing a lot of women from very destitute backgrounds to uh, biological males who could potentially inflict harm on them. And so this could perhaps be a luxury belief, but I'd have, I'd have to think more about it. You want to do a lightning round? <laughs> sure. Good or bad for the men? This is the question. Good All or right. bad. Good or bad. Right. On, like on the margins, like how things are happening right now. All right, okay. ready? You got sure, your cuts sure. up? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, compulsory high school. Good. Good for men. Yeah. Instead of like work programs or letting men opt out. Well, I didn't know we were going to have these other options yeah, available. Okay. Yeah. okay. I thought it was like, you know, well, of course, like, yeah, you know like, at eighth like, grade, they just go yeah. off and yeah. good luck. Or, like, okay. High school versus a work program during it. Oh, yeah. then, then, then bad because of the work program. Right. I didn't, if that was an option. Okay. okay. So we should have that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to lump these together. Porn and video games. Is bad. it good? That it's bad. Yeah. What about the thought that it's a kind of diversion from like more socially malevolent behavior? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that, that argument too. Um, ultimately, everything is going to have a cost. We're not going to have a perfect world where there's yeah. going to be no malevolent behavior at all. Uh, and so I think, pers I mean, I, you know, I, I would want to, you know, if there's empirical data available on this, but I think ultimately, the benefits would outweigh the costs it's in that situation. It. Yeah. Online dating. Bad. Why? For 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 men, right? Yeah, uh, on balance. Uh, I, for mean, the, I mean, I yeah. mean, well, because for so 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 guy. online dating is almost entirely based on appearance, and most guys aren't that good looking. <laughs> uh, but a lot of guys can develop their personalities and their talents and their skills and their conversational ability. There are other ways. I mean, you know, I just, yeah, uh, judging whether you want to date someone on, you know, based on like a two inch uh, pixelated 
you know, phone screen is, is probably not, not the best for, for, for men. So, they're, yeah, bad, ultimately bad. Capitalism. Hmm. I mean, like, like the currently existing kind of capitalism? Yeah, like a free market economic system. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Is generally good. I would say good, yeah. Uh, in general for men. Yes. All right, just yeah. wondering. Marriage. Good. Good. Yeah. For that. Yeah, good, good. I mean, am I supposed to elaborate? I don't no. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'll yeah. Your question too. Uh, <laughs> I can elaborate, no, but good. you know. Um, you say marriage is good for men. Yeah. Do you think it would be better if more men got married earlier? Uh, I mean, like the average age of marriage now is something like 30 or 31 yeah. or something. Um, yeah, it would probably be better. I mean, there's so much, so much research now on uh, on the sort of the, the the benefits of marriage as far as you know, married married men are less violent, they're less impulsive, less likely to um, commit crimes. I mean, you know, I've even seen studies where like pre and post uh, divorce. So after a divorce, a man is more likely to get involved in impulsive and risky behaviors. Yeah. Uh, and so, so ultimately, yeah, I think I think marriage sort of contains. Yeah. men's more sort of aggressive impulses. For men, losing a spouse lowers their life expectancy, but that's not true for women. Oh, Brutal. really? It's like, okay. yeah, ugh, rough. Yeah. All right, new question. Probably because they don't want to go to doctors, right? Yeah. And like often, you know, they're encouraged <laughs> to, yeah. And part of that is, is also involved with like the mating issue too, that men want to look tough and they don't want to acknowledge that they're injured or sick. And of course, like this, again, this isn't like a conscious thing that's playing out in their minds, but basically they just, they don't want to acknowledge vulnerability or weakness because they know this could potentially lower their mate value. But anyway. Ah, so they got on the market and then they just like forgo going to the doctor. So, oh, sorry. So the, the sorry, I'm just gonna do one of these. Hopefully it'll work, better? All right, all right, good. I'm just gonna talk real loud. Um, all right, new question. The gendered division of household labor. Should we aim for 50-50? Do you think that that's a good idea for people who are in heterosexual partnerships? Uh, I think leaving it up to the couples is better. I mean, are we, are we talking about like a mandate? You know, no, like I a, mean, is that, is that an ideal to, to aspire to? Like, should oh. couples aspire to a 50-50 gender division of labor? No, I think people should aspire to whatever works for their relationship. So it's not presumptively a problem if there's a skewed gender division of labor? I don't, I don't think so. No. More generally on the 50-50, do you think it would be good if institutions had 50-50 targets for the gender distribution within different occupations, so education, healthcare professions, but also male-dominated professions like you know, STEM professions, should both sides of those types of professions try to aspire for 50-50? Uh, I mean, so, so uh, this reminds me, I had a conversation uh, with, with my girlfriend the other day. I looked up the, uh, like the most male-dominated occupations and uh, the top two, it was like diesel engine mechanic and brick mason. And I asked her, you know, if you had to choose one of those two jobs, which would it be? And she was like, they both sound horrible. Like, I wouldn't, like, that sounds awful. And, uh, and so I think, like, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of compelling people to do something they don't want to do just to make things 50-50. I don't think that's a good idea. What do you think is the cause of occupational sorting by sex? in those professions? I mean, we have different psychological dispositions and propensities and interests. And I mean, this is like, this is a relatively well-documented finding now in uh, social psychology. Uh, it's called, sometimes it's called the Nordic paradox where gender differences increase uh, as a country becomes more sociopolitically equal. And so essentially men and women are more different from one another in countries like Denmark and uh, Sweden than they are in more sort of traditional societies like uh, Vietnam or B Botswana. And one argument I've read is that essentially when you have a society that's relatively rich and relatively free, people basically are more able to act on their interests and their desires. And so often, uh, you know, women in uh, professions that are, his, you know, historically more male dominated, often they come from developing countries and they choose occupations like engineering because they're more lucrative. But if you're from a rich country, uh, that's more economically secure, then you can study something like, like psychology, like I did. You, <laughs> you know, can sort into your yeah. <laughs> taste and talents. Yes, exactly. More yeah. specifically. Um, do you think that men are more competitive than women based on the things you said, or that men and women are just competitive in different ways? Um, hmm. Probably in different ways. I mean, men are, men's <clears throat> competition is more overt and, and often more, more physical and more physically confrontational. But yeah, we, I mean, women compete, compete as well, yeah. So you talked a lot about men and ambition and status. Is ambition uh, something that we should actually be leaning into, though? So sometimes I wonder that 
maybe it's not psychologically helpful for people to be ambitious because it has this zero sum cast. And so someone's always going to be at the bottom of the status hierarchy. To what extent should we work against that and try to minimize people's ambition so that they're not as bothered by status asymmetries? Uh, I mean, well, I, I guess we're kind of, I mean, we're kind of seeing this now. You see a lot of young guys who aren't very ambitious yeah. and people don't seem, like men and women don't seem to be particularly happy or satisfied with this. I mean, I, I don't think that, yeah, like status disparities can make people unhappy and there is some research on sort of how status inequality can, can be detrimental. But, but ultimately, I think, um, you know, having, having the, Having, having competitions available to people, I mean, often even, even when guys lose, like, they still feel something. They still, it's still better <laughs> than, than just sitting alone playing video games. I mean, I'm thinking of like, like even you know, young males who get into fist fights, even the loser often feels like you know, a little bit better about himself that he even participated in. I, I mean, I brought up the Mehinaku Society earlier where they have these wrestling contests and, uh, and, and this is compulsory and it works for their society to, to, to sort of stabilize things and to know where people stand. And I think like having that information available is often, often a good thing. Thinking ahead to the next forum speaker, do you think that there are any forms of discrimination against men that's wrongful discrimination or prejudices, prejudice, forms of prejudice that are disproportionately harmful towards men or practices uh, that discriminate against men? Uh, I mean, nothing comes immediately to mind. I mean, I don't know if it's like uh, harmful, but I have noticed that in, in academic disciplines that are skewed more male, there is like an effort to recruit more women. But then in disciplines that are more female, there's, you know, it, the people are profoundly uninterested in why there aren't more males. I mean, so I mentioned, you know, I study psychology and there were times at Cambridge where I was literally the only male in the lecture hall or, you know, some, I mean, that, that was a rare, you know, those were rare occasions, but more often, you know, less than 20% of the students were, were males, and no one really seemed to be particularly bothered by this. I wasn't even that bothered by it, but it was weird sometimes that, you know, you had to be the, and I've, I've actually, it's interesting, I've spoken to women about this too, where like, they become like the designated person on behalf of their sex or their gender, like, oh, I have to, because there's so many men and I'm the only woman, I have to talk about what it's, you know, and I, I felt like all I have to talk about is like, to be, I don't want to be the designated male to talk about, you know, and so I think in that sense, maybe this is kind of a, you know, some, some variation of, you know, discrimination or something. Huh. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. All right. My last question is about education. And people who are concerned about the young male syndrome who are educators with, you know, younger men in their life, high school age, college age men, what should they be doing differently that they're not doing right now that you think would be more helpful for addressing some of the problems that you identified? Um... Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I think even something, you know, I'm thinking of like a real world, like actual practical things we could do. I mean, one that comes to mind is to just like ban smartphones from schools. I mean, kids spend so much in, like they, you know, you, they're, they're gonna be back on the phone anyway, right? But at least they'll have a few hours where they're not constantly exposed to, um, you know, to, to that sort of never ending stream of content where they'll just have a sort of a reprieve uh, from that, and I think that would be a pretty easy, like I know there are going to be exceptions where maybe a kid has to stay in touch for medical reasons or something, but I think the standard should be, you know, the default should be no, no smartphones in class. Um, you know, I, I kind of came of age just as, I mean, just before the smartphone took off, but like I was in like the Motorola Razor flip phone era, yeah. and like the, the phones, we had them, but we weren't allowed to use them in class, and it wasn't that difficult to enforce. I mean, we still broke the rules and whatever, we still skirted the, you know, but, but I think generally, like, make it more difficult for kids to look at their phones in class. Totally, so. it's old school, we were like T9 texting, but like, why <laughs> is, yeah, you know, yeah. you have to like hit the W like four times. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But why, is, why do you think smartphones are especially bad for men? So we've seen a lot of research about the mental health dangers of smartphones for women, but like, what's the hazard for men in particular about this? About the smartphone? I mean... Hmm. Just in general. I yeah. mean, just in general. I, I, I don't know if there's like a specifically kind of you know, gendered reason why it would be particularly bad for, for boys, but I just think like generally having... Um, uh, time away from from that kind of content. I mean, I mean, one one thing that just comes to mind is like like porn. I mean, you know, like to give uh, you know like a 12 or 13 year old boy like a like a handheld device where you can see like all of the most like you know just graphic images. 
I, I just think there's, there's like a 0% chance that isn't having some effect on their psychological development and their perceptions of women, of sex. I mean, it's probably the same for, for, for girls too, but I mean, I think like, as I think back to like being a young boy, like there's, yeah, that's gotta be terrible for, for that kind of sexual development, so. Man, well, I support you in your anti-phone crusade, but um, so that was so interesting. Thank you so much. I've learned so much from your talk and thank you for answering all of these questions. And um, one more time, let's thank Dr. Rob Henderson.